Islamic uh, Spiritualities, uh, our webinar series. I'm Noman Nakvi. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Comparative Humanities at Habib University here in Karachi. Uh, allow me to begin by telling you a little bit um, about our series uh, before uh, I ask my colleague to introduce our distinguished speaker uh, for today. Uh, in the academic year 2020 to 2021, Habib University's program in comparative humanities and the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies launched a fortnightly webinar series titled Islam After Colonialism. The series charted the dramatic transformations under the devastating global impact of modern apartheid colonial rule in the nature of Islam in South Asia across culture, religion, politics, society, and the arts. In the event, the series received tens of thousands of views per webinar across global regions and groups, indicating the extensive public interest in the topic. The decolonial question of alternative pasts and futures was an important part of Islam after colonialism, given that contemporary concepts and imaginations of history, religion, politics, culture, and ethics remain hostage to the modern colonial heritage. This year, our new series, Decolonial Islamic, well, now it's old, actually, it's no, not so new anymore. Uh, our uh, series, Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities, while remaining in a similar constellation of concerns and perspectives, extends beyond South Asia, as well as focusing in on the spiritual, ethical, and religious resources and potentialities that have been marginalized or obscured through the co-optation of religion by colonialism and its inheritor, nationalism. In an increasingly troubled world, decolonial Islamic spiritualities are essential to the conceptual and existential strength of individuals and communities as they strive towards futures that are reparative rather than destructive. Uh, this is actually the uh, uh, final talk uh, in this series as we were discussing just before uh, we started. Um, our next series, which will be a few months from now, next term, uh, for my colleague, Dr. Sajjad Rizvi at the University of Exeter, uh, who is the director of the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. He's uh, not able to be here. And I'm very, very grateful to my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Noor Sobas Khan uh, from MIT um, to introduce uh, our speaker today and uh, join the discussion as well. Um, but um, the next series will be on poetry, philosophy, uh, and Islam. And as we were discussing just before the series, obviously poetry is, a, you know, it's just a, it's like the elephant in the room. It's uh, this uh, extraordinary uh, proliferation of poetic discourses right across the Islamic world, uh, which is actually how most people, uh, especially in a lived sense, uh, inherit and relate to and understand what it means to be a Muslim. Anyway, before, uh, well, that's for next term, uh, inshallah. Uh, but uh, uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Noor Sobas Khan and with so much gratitude for joining this discussion, uh, even though we asked her fairly late. Uh, but she's the most appropriate person, as you will soon find out uh, during the discussion as well uh, after uh, our distinguished speakers talk. Uh, tonight or this evening, as the case may be, or uh, actually in America, it's what, uh, afternoon? Yes. Uh, without further ado. Sure. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, I was genuinely thrilled um, to, to stand in for Sajjad uh, and hear uh, Janita's talk. So just to introduce Janita, Dr. Janita Karic is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Islamic Theology at Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, she's a very multifaceted researcher, thinker, and writer. Um, we're friends, so she's going to probably cringe as I'm giving her all of this flattery, but it's very genuine and, and very genuinely meant I'm a great admirer of her work and, and her thinking. Um, some of her publications, most recent publications include From Expansion to Contraction and Beyond, Zain al-Din al-Iraqi's al fiya and its relation to Ibn al-Salih's Muqaddimah, and the importance of being a haji, uh, Muhammad Kripo, and the wonders of pilgrimage. And uh, Janita writes um, widely on the hajj and also on devotional practices in Islam and um, has also extensively researched the thought of Edward Said and is uh, an expert on his thinking as well. Um, her book, uh, her monograph is on Bosnian hajis is coming out in December with Edinburgh University Press. 
and I would encourage you all to read it and have a look at it and it also features some very beautiful cover art I know um, so I look very much look forward to uh, to reading it as well so Janita without further ado please uh, very much look forward to hearing your talk uh, thank you so much Dr. Uh, Soberstan for this really really generous introduction um, too generous uh, thank you so much, Professor Nakvi, for uh, inviting me, and also uh, thanks to Professor Sajad Rizvi, who um, is not uh, sadly not with us today, for um, inviting me um, uh, to, to be a part of, of the series. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of it, and um, I'm also excited to be the last speaker in the series, which means that I literally have the last word in it. Um, <clears throat> So uh, basically I've been thinking about the decolonial framework which this um, series uses. Um, and I've been thinking about the terms we uh, usually associate with the decolonial, some terms and concepts and, and, and ideas. Um, and um, I've been thinking also about the ways in which we can um, go beyond the investigation of um, solely uh, you know, social and, and intellectual um, aspects of uh, modernities we are living in um, and perhaps also look into the Islamic heritage and uh, the mechanisms underpinning it in order to um, see all these different possibilities which can be used by um, researchers and, and, um, and believers and, and all these overlapping categories between the researchers and, and the believers as well. Um, so when, when we think about the decolonial, um, there are certain concepts which um, readily come to our mind. So it's, um, for example, we, we think about the revolutionary, we think about the subversive, we think about the resistance, you know, like all these very, very strong terms, uh, which imply almost um, a visible reaction to the violences of um, colonialism and, and um, nationalism as well. Um, so although that is obviously um, very valid, um, let me just share my screen. Um, obviously, that, that is very valid and we, we should continue um, pursuing um, um, the, the colonial thought in, in that way, and we should pursue um, uh, the investigation of intellectual history in, in that um, perspective. I'm wondering whether uh, there is something left out uh, when we co concentrate, when we focus only on the investigation of these grand gestures of, of resistance, grand gestures of, um, of subversion. Um, so in that sense, I would like to pay attention to um, something which is um, a very um, stable and, and key part of lives of Muslims, um, both contemporary and, and historical, um, and that is the ritual. The ritual is something which binds, uh, it's a binding thread between uh, Muslims past and Muslims present. Um, so in that case, um, I mean, this is not a revolutionary thought. The, the thing I'm saying is not really revolutionary. Uh, if you kind of think about um, some decolonial thinkers such as Jalal al-Ahmed or Ali Shariati, you could actually see that, um, uh, at least in the case of the two of them, um, they dealt with the ritual and specifically they dealt with the, uh, Hajj um, in order to uh, derive meanings, um, but also derive these potentialities through which they could um, change the world or at least propose an alternative modernity to uh, the modernity which um, they were living in and uh, which they were, I would also say, living through. So uh, investigating the ritual as in its decolonial capacity is, is not something new, but I think it, it should be um, given a, a second look um, uh, in, in our own times as well. Um, so two weeks ago, uh, my uh, colleague uh, Iyad Abu Ali spoke about the bodily and the effect, and he also spoke about the de derivation of the normative from uh, the devotional. So I'm very happy that my uh, presentation, my talk comes, um, follows, uh, follows uh, after his, uh, because I think that they're quite complementary in, in certain ways. Um, so while um, Iyad's talk dealt with, with the subversive, which is um, obviously evident in, in um, some bodily behaviors of uh, certain um, uh, Sufis and, 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 and uh, Sufi practices, I would like to focus on the ordinary. So what is the ordinary? What, what, is, the, um, what is the role of the ritual in, in this ordinary? And um, what does ordinary mean for the persistence of Islamic knowledge and Islamic practices 
uh, both present and, and, and past. Now, when we think about uh, the ritual um, and when we, when we kind of consider it in the context of academia, uh, we can see that um, the ritual has uh, been almost exclusively uh, studied in the frameworks of the legal and, and anthropological studies. Um, so uh, during the last couple of decades, there has been an effort uh, to, in a way, pinpoint um, the, the meaning, the essential meaning of the ritual and more specifically Hajj um, in the context of um, religious studies, in, in the context of anthropology, uh, etc. And obviously this desire to find the meaning um, has been rebutted. Um, and uh, most notably by uh, Marion Katz, who um, has um, argued uh, against this um, essentializational um, or um, against this um, essential essentialization of uh, of the Hajj and, and um, point, uh, pinpointing it uh, and putting it in only in, in the box of, of one meaning. Um, so, on the other hand, I would like to. Um, in a way, explore not the meaning of, 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 uh, of the ritual in Islam, but um, I would like to kind of explore the meaning making processes uh, which do happen in different uh, parts of the Muslim world um, and in obviously in different historical periods as well. Um, in that, um, I am inspired by um, some of the more recent research uh, into the um, nature of Islam. Um, most notably by uh, Kevin Reinhardt. Kevin Reinhardt has um, brought out um, a very interesting thesis where he proposes looking into Islam as, as language. So if we look in, into Islam as a language, uh, we can see different aspects of it. We can see, for example, Islam as, um, as a standard, um, as a colloquial, um, as cosmopolitan, and as coin. And in this um, division of, of of Islam or in these different aspects of Islam as a language, uh, the rituals belong to the koine, which means that they are shared by uh, Muslims across the, across the world um, and brought into their local context and given uh, very specific meanings in, in the local context. So what does it mean? It means that Muslims, most Muslims share um, the same devotion and same um, attachment to the rituals but the way they understand it, and the, the way they interpret it uh, uh, is in a way um, prone to, to um, the uh, necessities of a local context. So that's something which um, I think is really important to say when we, when we discuss um, uh, the concept of a ritual. Um, and the second thing which um, I also think is really important is uh, the question of the knowledge transmission. So, Obviously, there are rituals and uh, they exist and there are meanings given to them in different contexts, but how are they transmitted? So how are they transmitted from um, region to region? How are they transmitted from a generation to generation? Um, obviously, we could think of uh, the institution of the madrasa, and madrasa has been obviously uh, one of the key institutions uh, in Islamic history uh, through which uh, Islamic knowledge has been um, has been transmitted uh, from a generation to a generation. Uh, but I would like to explore other venues and other means of transmitting religious knowledge. Um, venues such as, for example, mektabs, but also um, venues and genres such as sermons and, and preaching. Because I think that um, if we explore um, these other venues, if we explore these other ways of transmitting Islamic knowledge, uh, we can actually see um, how people who were outside of the ulema, how, how people who did not belong to the ulema stra, uh, stratus actually gained knowledge about um, rituals in Islam. And when I say uh, uh, rituals uh, here, I, I uh, primarily mean the normative rituals such as um, hajj fasting, um, almsgiving and, and so on. So um, yeah, just, just a quick um, uh, comment uh, regarding the sermons. Um, my colleague from uh, the Berlin uh, Institute of, for Islamic Theology, uh, Aisha uh, Almila Akcha, has uh, recently organized um, a workshop on sermons in, in, um, in the Islamic world, uh, both uh, historical and in contemporary perspectives. Um, this, this volume, um, which um, is based on the proceedings of that workshop, is about to uh, be published later this year or um, early next year. Um, and 
what I will be talking about today or the case study, which I will be elaborating today is based on a chapter which um, I am uh, submitting to, to her body. So um, basically uh, what I would like to talk about uh, in more depth now is, uh, or are the early modern Ottoman Haworthy sermons. Now this is a big um, and, and, and maybe chunky um, title. Uh, so what does, um, what does it mean and, and, and what, what do I want to say with it? Why early modern, why Ottoman, why Haudati, and, and why sermons? Um, so basically, I would like to focus more concretely on the 17th century um, sermon collection uh, co compiled uh, by um, a Bosnian, a, a Ottoman Bosnian author, um, Ahmed Moezin Zade El Mostar. Now, the 17th century presents a very interesting um, period in, in, in the Ottoman history because it, we could in a way consider it the peak of um, certain religious processes which were going on uh, in the empire um, from the 15th century and onwards uh, up to the 18th century. So uh, these religious processes which were underway um, have been differently termed as um, obviously as Islamization, but also as Sunnitization and as confessional, confessionalization or confessionalism. Um, so these processes, which were investigated in depth by uh, Derin Terziolu and uh, Tiana Krstic, um, dealt with um, a specific religious dynamics, um, which uh, supported and spread or modeled uh, religious expression in, in the Ottoman Empire by infusing um, Sunni type uh, forms of piety, of uh, belief and of uh, practice. So um, this is really important to, to memorize as, as a context to, to these early modern Ottoman Haworthy sermons. And this modeling of religious expression um, included various actors. Um, some of them were, um, some, some of them include uh, the uh, actors belonging to the Ottoman state. So the Ottoman state obviously had, had a, a crucial role in, in this modeling of, of religious expression. But it was not the sole, uh, the, the sole actor in, in the whole um, uh, religious process. The process also included uh, Sufi um, shuyukh. Um, it, it included different Sufi orders. Um, it included uh, the bureaucratized dilemma, but also those who were opposing it. Um, and I believe, but we we need we definitely need more um, more research. Uh, it also involved the local actors as well. So the local practices. Uh, informed those practices um, above. So in the 17th century, uh, what also appears is a large number of um, preaching activities um, and the early modern Ottoman Halwati sermons are definitely a, a part of it. So the Ottoman Halwatis, um, such as uh, Ahmed Mazin Zada Mustari, um, acted uh, in local communities, but they also had um, links to the imperial center, such as um, Istanbul. Um, when we think about the Halwatis uh, and, and their writings, uh, we also have to think about um, what they, um, uh, we also have to think about the content of, of what they wrote. Um, so the Ottoman Halwatis wrote both devotional and the normative uh, literature. Um, and when they were writing uh, th this type of literature, they usually tried to combine the legal uh, aspects with um, ethical and exhortatory. Um, what does it mean? It means that, for example, when um, describing a certain ritual, they would, um, in a way, frame it uh, in the Quranic and, and the Hadith uh, argumentation, but at the same time, they would also point to um, the modes of behavior which um, someone was, which uh, a believer or a practitioner was supposed to emulate. And these modes of behavior were uh, heavily modeled upon uh, the early Islamic renunciant piety. So we, what we see here is the development of the um, ascetic practices uh, from the eighth or ninth century embedded into the 17th century context. So, so that was pretty much um, a large part of, of, of these writings as well. Um, also when, when thinking about the Ottoman holiday sermons in the Balkans, uh, we have to kind of observe it in relation uh, with what was going on in other parts of the Ottoman Empire. So what was going on, for example, in the Ottoman um, Mamluk regions. Uh, 
Um, and if we look into uh, the literature which was written about uh, the Ottoman Helvetis, but in Egypt, we can see the similar process going on there as well. So uh, what was going on there was the production of prayer books, the production of different types of manuscripts, treatises, um, all of which is really comparable to what is going on in the Ottoman Balkans as well. In the Ottoman Balkans, for example, we have uh, the emergence of um, different types of manuals, which are dedicated to um, correct beliefs. Um, and obviously that has to be observed in a context um, of interaction with, with the local Christian population. So, so um, all these types of manuals uh, do have a, a very concrete reason why they, why they appeared and why they um, were so um, influential. So um, this is where, uh, yes, so, so now uh, the Halwet is in Bosnia. Uh, the Halwet is in Bosnia um, have been a part of uh, the research by, by modern scholars. Um, for example, uh, the Halwet is in, in the Balkans in general have been um, the subject of, of, of these different studies. Um, they have been looked as a part um, of the Ottoman uh, Force of the Ottoman, so the Ottoman Halwetis were looked were observed as, um, in a way, as um, allies to the Ottoman state. That's the major framework in, in through which uh, the Ottoman Halwetis were observed. To kind of see um, how widespread in a society they, they were, in especially in the Ottoman Bosnian society, uh, we can look into the local studies, um, such as the one by Jamal Chahaj, uh, which is now slightly obsolete but still um, contains certain. Uh, uh, useful information. Um, so uh, the Halvetis in Bosnia uh, belong to all uh, ranks of the society, so we could find them um, in, in, on every level from uh, the Ottoman administrators to um, uh, leaders of, of, of Sufi orders uh, to, to the ulema. So they, they really uh, were very visible in the society um, all until um, the 19th century. Um, and this is where we turn to um, Ahmed Moazin Zade al Mostari. So, Ahmed Moazin Zade al Mostari, uh, the author I, I worked on, um, what we know about him is that he was active in, um, in Mostar, um, a city in Bosnia, um, and that he had uh, links to the ulema in um, Užica, which is modern day Serbia. Um, Ahmed Moazin Zade uh, was con well connected with, with other. Uh, preachers in, in, in the region, uh, other Haliti preachers. Um, and uh, just if, if I may um, uh, give a small detour, um, basically uh, Mostar in, in this period um, contained uh, even the institutions for the uh, study of uh, Mathnavi. So for example, we find a, a whole institution which is dedicated to the study of Bumi's Mathnavi. Um, and this practice of studying the Mathnavi um, has been continuing uh, throughout uh, the Ottoman period and even beyond. So a couple of months ago, um, I attended um, um, a sermon uh, in a teke in Sarajevo, where uh, the preacher has uh, read uh, the verses from Methnevi in Persian, then translated them into Bosnian, and then interpreted them uh, to the audience. Um, and it was really interesting to observe that the audience, um, both men and women, obviously, um, they did not know Persian uh, and they flocked you know, in great numbers to, to listen to, to the sermon uh, on, on the Methnavi in the midst of the pandemics. So um, this is, some, this is in, in a way, um, I think a very living tradition and we can see that um, it started somewhere in, in the 16th century and it lasted all, it lasts until, until the 21st century as well. Um, so probably in, uh, we could also look for the decolonial possibilities in, in these um, ways in which a certain practice such as the study of the methodology can be very persistent and continuous from the 16th to the 21st century. So again, to go back to, to Ahmed Moazin Zad al um, he has written several uh, sermon collections and I will, talk about two today, um, Anisul Wa'izin and Muharrik Kulkulu. Um, in the first one, uh, Anisul Wa'izin, as you can see here, this sermon collection contains several hundred um, chapters. So if you look at, in, if you look at the content of, of all these chapters, you can see that, yes, 
Firstly, they talk about uh, different types of uh, normative rituals, but they also talk about all kinds of devotional rituals. So um, the Muazin Zade has uh, written chapters about the devotional rituals, uh, such as prayers in the nights of Rajab or Shaban or uh, during Laylatul Miraj. So this is obviously very um, close to him and um, he in a way um, combined both the devotional prayers with uh, the considerations of the auspicious times. And um, the sermon collection also deals with, uh, for example, psychological states. There are chapters which deal with the fear of death. Uh, there are chapters which deal with how to polish one's heart and how to kind of purify one's heart. Um, there are obviously chapters which deal with, uh, with, uh, with different types of um, bodily practices. Uh, so for example, um, the, the importance of, of, of ablution uh, and so on. So what we could see here, if we look into this um, content page of, of the manuscript, what we could see here is that um, basically all different aspects of religiosity, which are crucial for a human being's life, um, for a believer's life, are kind of mapped out here. So anything from the body to the soul is, is mapped out here, and it's mapped out in, in almost like equal, equal measure. Um, the, um, obviously, uh, the, these chapters uh, and, and um, um, these sermons, I would say, individual sermons also deal with, with the social aspects. Um, so, for example, how uh, the ritual, in a way, uh, relates to um, how, how uh, a person, for example, um, relates as a believer to um, other people. So you have uh, chapters on, on marriage, on, on, on community, etc. cetera. Um, so when we look into uh, the, very concretely, if we look into the devotional uh, rituals, which are mentioned here, and I mean here specifically those uh, rituals which are connected to times such as, for example, uh, months of, of Rajab or months of Shaban. What is uh, noticeable is um, this zeal to kind of argument it and argument it really well. Um, I know that, I, that in my title I've mentioned going beyond the uh, obedience, but um, I think um, we shouldn't drop the concept of obedience so, so quickly. So uh, basically in, in here, in, in, uh, in his elaboration of the rituals, he mentions the concept of pa'a um, quite a lot. And uh, especially the pa'a in, in, in uh, pa or, or the obedience in relation to the prophet. So he says that the person has to be obedient to, to God and then what derives from it is the obedience to the prophet and then later on you know, um, obedience to, to, to the people of, of knowledge. Um, Basically, this obedience to the prophet is um, extremely emphasized in um, elaborating the devotional uh, the, the devotional rituals. So, not those rituals such as Hajj or prayer or uh, almsgiving, but the rituals uh, which are done or performed uh, during the months such as Rajab or, um, uh, or Shaban. So now, when, when we think of it, um, there had to be a certain very concrete reason why uh, the author is insisting so much on the concept of obedience uh, in relation to these types of rituals. Again, when we think of the 17th century, we also have to think of it as, um, as an age of, of huge polemics. So this was the age in which um, questions, uh, which might not be so relevant for us today, uh, seem to define um, who is a believer and who is outside of, of the fold of uh, belief. So the questions, for example, of um, the fate and faith of prophet's parents, or uh, the question of the fate and faith of uh, the Pharaoh when he was drowning, were almost the crucial ones for uh, people who, who debated uh, in, in, in the 17th century. Um, and obviously we can see the reflections of uh, debates surrounding Ibn Arabi here as well. So a middle path between these uh, debates uh, was um, attempted by Khatib Chalabi, um, who wrote um, a, a work titled Mizan al-Haq fi ikhtiyar al-Haq, uh, The Balance of Truth, um, where he tried to find this middle way between uh, these different strands of, of, um, of polemics. So 
what was really important uh, for all the participants in, in these polemics is to kind of ascertain their, their way and ascertain their place in the um, Sunni community or in Ahl Sunnah. Um, and basically it kind of got reflected onto these sermons as well and onto even the devotional literature. So um, I've been looking into different types of devotional, um, um, de devotional treatises uh, from the early 17th century up to the late 17th century. And what I noticed is uh, that there is this huge desire to kind of argument whatever a person says um, or, what, or whatever practice one proposes, um, they, are, they were very bound to kind of um, frame it in, in, in terms of, of hadith and in terms of allegiance to the prophet. So for example, um, I've done some work on, uh, on the fabile of, of the ziyara to the prophet's grave. Um, and then there, is, there was this whole um, argumentation how um, certain practices are allowed because these, these practices have been um, uh, approved by the prophet. So there is constantly this desire to, uh, in a way, show the allegiance to the prophet and to show that, uh, that um, someone who is proposing a certain uh, practice um, is doing so by adhering to the prophet and not by uh, adhering to the bid'ah or inventing a bid'ah or, or something like that. So that is, th that is definitely something which um, uh, we can notice in, in the elaboration of these devotional, uh, devotional uh, rituals, such as, for example, prayers in, in Shaban or prayers in, in Rajab and so on. And now we come to uh, the question of, okay, so this, is, uh, this happened with the devotional rituals. But what happened with the normative rituals or what we today perceive to be normative rituals such as uh, prayer and, and hajj? Um, so basically we have to kind of look in, into the Sufi context of the, or, or the Sufi dimension of, of these Halwati sermons to, to see that. Um, so in Anisul Waizin, uh, in, in this huge sermon collection, um, there is obviously a section on how to become a Halwati, how to become a Halwati person or a Halwati um, seeker. And apart from uh, the proposal that um, one should um, follow a certain type of uh, prayer or, or one should uh, perform a certain type of prayer whole life, um, there is a very strong emphasis on, uh, on the normative rituals. So one cannot be, become a Sufi unless one um, you know, performed all five prayers um, in a community. So that is, is something which is really emphasized. Um, the, the prayers, going on a hajj, almsgiving, all of these things have had to be fulfilled before one could um, continue with the Hawati path. Um, the second way to kind of look into the normative rituals and how they were presented is offered by uh, the other sermon collection by uh, Ahmed Mazen Zad al which is the Muharrik al or, or the mover of the hearts, where, um, I mean, th this was a hugely popular um, sermon collection, which existed in excerpts, uh, which we could find in, in, in later centuries, in the 18th century, for example, as well. So in Muharrik al um, the chapters I, I found, uh, in, in those chapters, the author uh, looked into the question of Hajj. So the Hajj was interestingly presented as a multifaceted phenomenon. Um, on the one hand, um, the prime, like the primary level uh, through which the Hajj was um, elaborated was obviously um, the slightly legalistic level. So the author would say that um, uh, people have to go on Hajj because if they neglect the duty and if they are able to, uh, they risk dying um, as non-believers. So that, that was like really, really plainly placed like that. However, um, the second level of, of this sermon um, goes beyond that. So if you remember um, uh, me saying uh, that when we look in, into the, the content page of, of a sermon collection, we could see how it relates to all the aspects of the religious life of, of, of a believer. Um, so in this way, also, if we look into, into how Hajj was elaborated, we could see that the ritual, the normative rituals, on the other hand, placed in all these other types of connections and, and um, obligations to other people, to, to family, to community, but also to God. So on this other level, second level of um, the propagation of Hajj or the installation of Hajj or the ideas on Hajj, uh, what we could see is that the author actually places Hajj um, as an ethical duty. 
So it's about, it, one should go on Hajj and perform Hajj only if one is sure that they're not going to infringe upon the rights and duties of other people. So if one is absolutely certain that they are not going to leave the, the family in debt or um, uh, if, they're, if, if they owe money to someone else uh, or, or something like that. Um, they also, um, the author also emphasizes that the intention which uh, one carries should be very, very pure. So one shouldn't go on Hajj if one wants to go uh, because of trade or uh, uh, if one just goes, wants to go to frolic, to, to have fun for the Tefaruj. So in all these occasions, one shouldn't go on Hajj. So there is this like second level where um, Hajj is not really just something you do. So hajj is something which you have to actually have um, a very clear purpose um, for, for doing it. Um, the third level is obviously the Sufi level, which is interwoven here. And it kind of goes con contrary to the, to the very aim of, of, uh, of writing uh, like a chapter on Hajj. Uh, on the third level, the author simply says, well, you know, the Hajj you do is the Hajj of the body. And it can be done only once a year, and it can be done only in, in one specific place. So what he proposes instead is the Hajj of the hearts. So you have the Hajj of the hearts, which uh, can be done in, in every possible moment of, of, of life and in every possible place. Now, this sounds like a bit of a, a contradiction. You know, on the one hand, you have someone who's proposing uh, to, to uh, and, and you know, encouraging people to go on Hajj. And on the other hand, uh, there, are, uh, there is this strong um, sense of that, well, yes, there is the Hajj of the bodies, but the Hajj of the hearts uh, is obviously more important and the Hajj of the hearts can be done anywhere. You know, it can be done in Bosnia um, as well as, as anywhere else. Um, so, I mean, obviously one of the ways we can look at it is to simply say, well, this is a Sufi interpretation and that's it. But I would say that um, the author of, of this uh, sermon, uh, the author of this collection, sermon collection actually knew his audience very well. And it's a fact that a majority of uh, Muslims could not go on a Hajj in, in the pre-modern times. Um, and basically, if they couldn't go, if they couldn't go financially or, or for any other reason, uh, they probably wanted to have a, a sense of a certain substitution ritual or, or substitution practice, which they could actually fulfill, even though they're unable to go on a Hajj. So in, in this way, I see that um, these Sufi sermons, such as Muazin Zade al Mustari's, also fulfilled a very keen psychological and didactic uh, role um, in um, you know, still nurturing the connection to Mecca and Medina, but uh, making people, people kind of content with, uh, with the lives that they already lead uh, and uh, to kind of um, do not make them miserable for not going on Hajj physically in, in a way. So basically um, to, in a way, conclude, um, I would say that uh, these Ottoman Halwati sermons dealt with um, both the devotional and the normative, and sometimes also the overlapping uh, devotional and normative aspects of the rituals. As we could see, the, uh, they, um, in a way, exerted different energies in describing these different rituals. So the rituals they felt uh, lacked more certain uh, ground, uh, they dedicated more argument argumentation to to those rituals which they didn't have to uh, you know, justify, Sorry, for example, Hajj, um, they kind of were more free to, to give additional um, explanations and, and, and additional elaborations. What we could also see is that there are different actors involved in the transmission of religious knowledge in, in these, in these pre-modern times. Um, and uh, you know, people gained religious knowledge through different means, not necessarily only through madrasa. They also gained um, uh, knowledge through uh, listening to, to these sermons. Uh, and by the way, the sermon was written in, in Arabic, uh, but it contained uh, interpolations in, in, in Ottoman Turkish, uh, which leads me to, to think that uh, it was probably meant for the circulation among the, uh, the literate people um, in, of Ottoman Bosnia, not necessarily the ulema, uh, but the literate people. Um, and finally, uh, through these, um, types of sermons and through this type of literature, what we could see is that there are definitely different mechanisms of the cultivation of the body and the cultivation of the soul. 
Um, and maybe most importantly, there are different mechanisms of uh, preserving Islamic knowledge and kind of um, making it continuous um, to uh, centuries um, after, um, uh, after these sermons were, were created. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, Noor? Uh, sure. just, yeah. yeah, yeah. Shall I jump in with some questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Janita. That was a really beautiful talk and uh, really wonderful and original topics that you're addressing. Um, you're always very humble about your research, but I think you're actually breaking very new and original ground with this investigation. And I'm, I, I was super excited to hear it. Um, just starting off with kind of a basic, well, it's a basic question that's also a little bit complicated. Um, uh, and I'm asking also just so that, uh, you know, the wider audience who are listening can get uh, a grounding in these concepts. But how would you define, you talk a little bit about this, but how would you define the normative versus the devotional? in the context of, of you know, um, these sets of sermons that you're looking at, but also more widely in your work, it would be great to, to yeah, for you to contextualize it in your, your wider thinking. Well, you know, like these are very flexible categories, both the normative and devotional. They are very, very flexible. And um, although it may, it may have come, um, come out wrongly, but I do not really put them in, in, a, in, a, um, in a contrast. Uh, so very, simply normative, the normative is something which um, I would say the, the, the community agrees upon. So certain things can become normative with age. So, uh, so certain practices, certain rituals can become normative because you know the community decides upon. Uh, when we talk about the normative rituals in Islam, I, I would say that uh, those are the rituals which are agreed upon commonly by a majority of Muslims, such as, you know, people do not deny the, the, the validity and, and the necessity of Hajj, for example, um, the necessity of, of, of prayer or the necessity of, of almsgiving. Now, obviously there are different realizations of these rituals in, in different contexts, and um, that is something else. But like the very notion of the normative ritual um, is in this context relates to, to something which the majority of Muslims have agreed upon as, you know, this is something which, those are basic Islamic duties. Um, and, you know, they kind of become, uh, they are the norm for, for majority of Muslims past and present. However, that doesn't mean that um, other types of practices cannot become normative or cannot become the norm. And I think what we can see here in, in these sermon collections is the way of the author to kind of push you know, the practices done on, on these, you know, on, on, in Rajab, in Shaban, he's trying to push them to become a norm. And he's trying to, you know, argument it very well to, to kind of show, well, you know, there, there is a very firm normative ground for making these rituals common. And there is, you know, we, we do have the sources and they tell us this, 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 so we have to kind of make them, make them the norm. Um, so I would say that the term normative is quite um, flexible, but uh, the way I see it is it's something which the, you know, there is the consensus and, and there is the community and, and that's something which the community has agreed upon. When it comes to the devotional, that's I think even a trickier question uh, because, um, you know, the, all these terms are very hard. It's really hard to translate them in, into, for example, Arabic. Um, so it's, fine to, it's hard to find the equivalent for them. Is it ta'abud? Is it abudiya? What, what is it, you know, devotion? Um, so the way I, I kind of try to, to uh, look at it is uh, by not juxtaposing it or by not by, you know, making a contrast to the normative rituals of, of, of hajj and, and, and uh, prayer and, and these uh, nor firmly normative rituals in Islam, but by, um, you know, looking into, into some other uh, manifestations which revolve around so, for example, do they do they do these do these rituals evoke emotions? Do they evoke certain additional pr practices? Do they evoke material, you know, objects? So, if if you know a ritual kind of does all of this, then you know it's it's a devotional ritual, and it can be obviously Hajj as well. It can be it can be a prayer. You know, we pray and we we use the 
the uh, Tisbi, for example. So it, it's it's definitely a, you know an additional devotional um, element or devotional object. Um, so um, in a way, um, you know, the terms are not really the perfect ones, but I think um, they shouldn't be observed in, in a contrast, and uh, they should be kind of elaborated in, 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 in individual contexts. Great, yeah, and that was also just a question more for the, the audience who are listening out in the ether who might want to know a bit more about the these categories and, and kind of the way that we use them and um, in looking at, you know, manuscripts and, and, uh, and, and histories of sermons. So I have a question also about the specific, the kind of the, you know, talking about um, the ritual and bodily practice. And I was a bit curious about the kind of um, like sensorial and acoustic aspects of the sermons and like the um, the affective qualities of them. And if you see that as part of, you know, this kind of cultivation of piety, or maybe even like, do you see it as, you know, maybe one of the techniques of confessionalization Mm -hmm. um yeah i would just like to hear your thoughts on that on kind of the the the, the acoustic the and the, the yeah aspects. yeah and and yeah and like do you kind of consider this like the you know the acoustic and sensorial qualities of the sermon as a bodily practice mm -hmm. uh yeah so, <laughs> so yes that, that's a great question but mm -hmm. um we definitely have a problem with with, with sources at least mm -hmm. i have i have a problem with sources so um you, for example, get a whole sermon collection, which is so neatly done, which is really, um, you know, very, very elaborate in, in um, you know, in the structure and everything. But it doesn't really contain info on how it was actually used. Mm -hmm. So you, at least in my case, it's, it, it's been really hard to um, point out who the exact audience of this was. Um, I can do that through these smaller notes on the margins, which mm. point out that um, the author you would, for example, mention a, a word like, I don't know, the Faruj or something in Arabic, then he would kind of note it down uh, in Ottoman Turkish, what does it mean? And, and so, so to kind of point out to, this, to someone who was either uh, reading it um, uh, or commenting on it, on it in, in a way so... Mm -hmm. Like, like, like a small, um, like a short, I don't know, notice uh, and, and explanation. So you do have that. So it kind of gives us some um, notion of who was the user of, of, of these sermon collections. However, there is another thing which makes me think that these sermons were actually read out uh, mm -hmm. in public, um, and that's their length. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not too long. Mm -hmm. They're really, really not too long. So mm -hmm. they're quite, you know, compact, I think, for um, like, you know, for a decent time mm -hmm. uh, in, in which, you know, people could listen and, and, and you know, perhaps um, understand as well. So maybe that. Um, there are, on the other hand, however, um, other types of khutbas, which I found in, in random manuscripts, mm -hmm. which would be just like one page, mm -hmm. scribbled, like scribbled really, really like briefly, uh, which makes me think like, well, okay, this was definitely done for, for maybe a wider perusal or, or something. Mm -hmm. So um, the sources are not really very generous when it comes to, um, when, it, when it comes to the reception or, or very more concretely a bodily reception. And I think I, I should also um, read more on, on, on the general context of um, how uh, sermons were, um, you know, um, held uh, in the early modern period in general. Mm. So. Yeah, I wonder is if there's a genre, and I don't know if this exists or not, but you know, the way that we have like Adab al-Qadi, uh, mm. you know, Adab al and everyone has an Adab that they, you know, a kind of, you know, book of, yes. you know, guidelines and etiquette yeah. and, and things, you know, for, for your particular profession. And I yeah. wonder if there's like an Adab for the, the you know, for the khutbah. Uh, in terms of like modulating the voice and the tone and the emotion that that's supposed to, you know, evoke in the audience, almost a rhetoric, right? Or like uh, aesthetics of the, of the khutbah, if we have any texts like this. Yeah, um, yes, th that's also a great question. Um, it's just, the thing is, um, the sermons, you know, um, I mean, there is a difference between the was and, and the khutbah. Mm. And basically the khutbah, um, khutbah is meant to be, to, to be read out in, in, in public. 
uh, but there was not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But still, still, like to go, go back to your uh, to your uh, question, um, the this sermon collection contains uh, these instructions for the wa'isi, for those okay. who preach. So if there is if there is even like a couple of chapters on what the one who is um, a wise should should do, you know how what they should kind of assess the audience and relay mm. the message and things like that. So that was definitely a thing. That was definitely mm. a thing. yeah. Yeah, and in terms of the 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 wise or the the wise, how like do we have any evidence that women were at all engaged in reading and delivering these as well? Like if it's not you know. If like if you know the book of sermons like you mentioned the Anis al Waizin and the Muharrak al Qulub like uh, you know if these are sort of shorter sermons uh, mm -hmm. you know having that are supposed to have some kind of moral or religious edification mm -hmm. is there any evidence that women would listen to these or yes. read them as well yes yeah. uh, so basically two things uh, one is um, I think there is a researcher who is doing work on um, um, on the female role or, or mm. in, in sermons and and uh, preaching. Uh, his name is uh, Alexander Halili. Okay. I think he's in, in Exeter. Um, so he's also contributing to this volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and he's specifically looking into that. Uh, but the second thing to, to go back to the um, to Ottoman Bosnian context, yes. So basically, there are um, there is evidence which um, has recently been studied by um, Professor Karima Filan from uh, Sarajevo University, uh, who has looked into um, so these, let's say, alternative ways of education in, in mm. Ottoman Bosnia, and found out uh, through different types of wakufname um, uh, and, and, and all these kinds of documents, um, she found out that there were actually institutions or wakuf which would be um, allocated only for female education. Mm -hmm. So you, you would have a certain type of a, like a mektab or something where, you, mm -hmm. where a, a female preacher would come and then instruct uh, girls, uh, usually girls, in, into you know uh, tenets of, of, of religious knowledge, and what I found really interesting is that um, the huge amounts of money were actually allocated to the education of, of uh, female children in, in that mm -hmm. regard. So um, there were you know there were ways of um, educating, um, I would say, all parts of the population in a way, mm -hmm. um, which are which, which we might not see. So obviously, if we just look into, into Madrasa as, as the main venue of education, as the main space of education. And I mean, I, I kind of started thinking about this question of, of um, women participation in, uh, mm. um, in, in sermons and preaching, um, simply by, by, kind, by kind of looking into, into examples of, for example, my grand, grandmother, who was, uh, you know, by all standards, illiterate. Uh, but still, you know, like her religious practice was impeccable. Like she knew, you know, a lot. Uh, like her religious knowledge was really, really wide. So you, you kind of tend to think like, how were these women obtaining this knowledge? Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, preaching um, activities, even under really, really hard circumstances, like for example, socialist Yugoslavia's repression mm -hmm. of religious activities. Still, you know, like there were certain types of um, um, venues where this religious education through preaching was was um, kind of tolerated. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, when when we think about these things historically, I sometimes think that we also have to think about them in, in, in a very contemporary perspective. I mean, it, it's not all unbroken. And so yeah. sometimes things you see here today among you know our grandmas, um, they you know, they, there is a root in, in, in somewhere, mm -hmm. and there is a continuity somewhere. And I think, again, to go back to the decolonial, I yeah. think it's, it's our task to kind of undig these yeah. um, modes and mechanisms of continuity. So, you know, how do Muslims, you know, stay Muslim in practice mm -hmm. um, throughout, you know, all these challenges in, in, in these mm -hmm. different, um, different time periods? And, and, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this connection with ritual and bodily practice is a great example of that, right? It might not be a textual, mm -hmm. you know, what, you know, what as scholars, we would like to consider a kind of continuity, which is, oh, this manuscript, right? But yeah. it's, you know, the, the ritual even of prayer, or I mean, uh, you know, these are, are very, as you say, very strong and continuous practices. And actually that, you know, you concluded uh, your question in such a way that it leads very nicely to the next question I wanted to ask you, which is this idea of the, the decolonial possibilities of the ordinary, which mm -hmm. I thought was a very, very poetic way of, uh, of framing your topic and your, and your talk and, and really very beautiful because you're right, we focus so much on 
you know, these grand and actually sometimes violent gestures of revolution mm -hmm. or resistance and, um, and, you know, and, and fail to recognize things as simple as, you know, these spaces that are created for, you know, conveying of knowledge orally or the teaching of prayers mm -hmm. or even things as simple as, you know, ways of sitting or standing or eating or showing respect or, you know, all of which have a lot to do with bodily comportment, um, you know, in, in, in each culture or community. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, you know, I'm curious as to how we can make the link between this, this decolonial of the ordinary with the, the early modern sermons kind mm -hmm. of to the present day. Like, how do we like where 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 are the the resonances and links between the the kind of sermon culture of early modern um you know ottoman bosnia and and maybe you know cultures of knowledge transmission in bosnia today which you kind of touched on with your grandmother um, but i'd love to hear more of your thoughts yeah basically i mean first um to kind of just uh, um, say a bit more about why um, i find the ordinary even more challenging and more exciting than these grand gestures of, of you know, mm -hmm. suppression and, and, mm -hmm. and resistance. And, um, you know, these grand gestures sometimes simply um, respond to the colonial challenges. And, and they, they're still um, responding to something which uh, is dictated by, you know, colonial, by the national, mm -hmm. you know, it's still mm -hmm. dictated, like the terms of the debate are still dictated by, um, quote unquote, the oppressive side or the oppressing side. While the mechanisms of the ordinary actually, you know, they, they I think that they do more, um, more substantial work uh, in terms of, you know, they're, they're sometimes not even conscious and mm -hmm. they perpetuate uh, certain ways of living, certain ways of certain practices, certain beliefs uh, in a way which is actually very natural to, to the communities in which, in which they arise and, and uh, which are, I mean, they do not imply, um, um, now I'm trying to kind of escape the quietism uh, and, and right, I, know right, that, right. I know that there is definitely a danger in, in observing the rituals only from, you know, individualist perspective and mm -hmm. not seeing the social impact mm -hmm. and the social potential. But I think like this, these ordinary practices are actually um, more, um, um, what's the right word? Um, they can be more revolutionary in some ways. Mm. I mean, when we kind of think of, of Hajj, for example, in the 19th mm -hmm. and 20th century, I mean, all the colonial powers were really, really upset about them, about mm. the Hajjis going on Hajj, you know, like tons of Hajjis, many of them, you know, very illiterate, going on a Hajj is something which really upset both the colonial and, and, and later on nationalist um, mm. structures and, and nationalist powers. So I think that there is definitely this, this potential in, in the persistence of, of, of a religious practice, uh, which is um, strong, but maybe not, not that obvious. So how can we, what can we do uh, with Bosnian Ottoman sermons and, and um, well, um, forms of practice today? Well, I, I don't think that there, there has been a huge rupture. I mean, obviously the nation state frameworks did their own damage. Um, the, I mean, modernity is something which we all have to go through, like it or not. <laughs> um, but I think that there are certain ways of um, preser preserving um, knowledge and practice, not necessarily replicating it, mm -hmm. but seeing the, behind, the logic behind. Mm -hmm. So what was the logic behind this um, Moazin Zade's insistence that, well, you know, if you can't go on Hajj, it's okay. You can do the Hajj of the Hearts. Mm. So I think that there is a lot of mercy, for example, in it. There is mm. a lot of understanding, you know, mm. the audience who, who one is talking to. And I think mm. these underlying mechanisms are actually more important than, uh, you know, the actual realization, you know, mm -hmm. what is going to be said. So the principles of, of I don't know, mercy, understanding um, is something which we can definitely apply or, or, or try to apply in, in, in our modern age. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll hand over. I think Noman looks like he has some questions brewing. I can, I can tell. So I'll hand yeah. over to him, and then I, I probably will. I have some more things I want to ask, but I, let me hand over to to Noman. <laughs> you know me too well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you probably know, uh, Janita, that uh, Noor was uh, our colleague here at uh, Habib University for a while, uh, so she obviously knows my tics, <laughs> right? As a result, but yeah, you know, it's a very exciting discussion. 
so uh, I also want to uh, participate. Uh, so I have some thoughts uh, and some questions uh, as well. Uh, first of all, you know, one of the, as uh, in the uh, description at the beginning uh, of uh, this session uh, of the series, uh, so the, you know, the, one of the terms that are in my mind uh, goes uh, more and more with decolonial is reparative. Mm -hmm. And I like, uh, you know, the, um, because uh, so it's a question of healing. And I like that repairing healing. Uh, and I like that a lot because also, uh, you know, philosophy itself is supposed to be healing. Uh, one of the oldest functions of philosophy um, uh, is therapeia in the Greek, which is, uh, of course, we today the word therapeutic, but uh, and for, it has some unfortunate uh, psychobabble type of connotations, uh, but that's not what it's supposed to mean. It's supposed to mean healing. So, um, so yes, and of course, um, that has to do with matters not just of, I mean, I think that, you know, these dimensions are obviously very, very, you must have uh, an ethically sound subject to carry out uh, those kinds of other, you know, the kinds of things that we associate with decoloniality, yeah, the things that you mentioned. Um, so immediately I thought, I'm thinking, the image came to my mind from, um, a novel written in 1942 by Isma Chukhtai. She wrote a book called Teddy Lakir. Uh, and one of the things, she, which means crooked line, and she sort of maps the culture of the left uh, in, the, uh, in the early 1940s. Yeah. Uh, and uh, many of the men that she writes about, you know, have terrible ethics. Yeah. I mean, they're revolutionaries, etc. cetera. Um, they're not ethically sound subjects. I think this is one of the major reasons, uh, in fact, for the failure uh, of the left is that uh, despite its you know, very noble uh, aspirations, it didn't have an ethics that went with the politics. And, and to my mind, ethics and spirituality are intimately related to each other. Um, so the restoration or the reparation uh, of the subject, uh, I think, and I, you know, I, I know, you, I know exactly what you were talking about when you said quietism, you know, the danger of quietism, but, uh, you know, um, we must be quiet at times, surely, right? I mean, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, in order to heal ourselves and, and, uh, you know, in order to be able to really uh, listen, you need to be quiet in order to listen for one thing. Yeah, to, to be able to uh, respond to the world uh, properly. And listening is also actually um, an act of obedience. Yeah, what else is listening? Um, so that's why you make a distinction between hearing and listening. So you're not listening to me. So in order to listen to somebody, one must, uh, you know, it's, a, it's almost an act of obedience. Listening itself is an act of, so I mean, I'm thinking of your, so the other thing, we, uh, I'm mixing everything up, but that's the way I think. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, so the, the other thing I was thinking of was when I was thinking about ritual. Um, you know, it's just like they, uh, in contemporary modern cognitive culture, they uh, really uh, sort of uh, undermine memorization, rote learning, they call it. Uh, as if one could think without anything in one's memory. Yeah, uh, how is it possible? Yeah, uh, to think without having anything in one's head, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, so the, as, as as if one as, as if cognition and memory could be taken apart from each other. Yeah, uh, similarly with ritual. Yeah, and neither neither memory nor ritual are reducible to themselves. I mean, the purpose of uh, both uh, memory and ritual is something beyond the ritual itself. I mean, the, and the purpose of obedience. I mean, I think of ritual, I mean, when you are actually carry out, when you're trying to pray, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, you have these excellent words that are given to you that you have inherited. Uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Rahim. Right? But when you are actually trying to perform that ritual, when you're actually trying to, you know, inwardly enunciate, what you're trying to do is to actually connect with that which the words are about. So something that is beyond the ritual. So the ritual is actually not reducible to itself. Mm -hmm. It's actually precisely about, uh, uh, you know, trying to go beyond 
beyond the ritual itself because the the purpose of the ritual is uh, not the ritual the purpose of the ritual is something beyond the ritual um, uh, so in any case you know rit uh, ritual is all, all about uh, self transcendence and self transformation uh, that's what uh, that uh, the ritual is only there this is a word i find myself using a lot is, is and, you know this is uh, i mean this is a lot also for you know all the students listening in to our session and say a lot of what i'm saying in mind of the audience the students this is a you know university webinar series um uh, the a word that i use more and more and i you know somebody just referred me to a book about it the philosophy of orientation orientation ritual obviously serves to orient uh, uh orient us um and and uh, then the task is to uh, obviously uh, go beyond that yeah so orient then you have a path to uh, to follow so those are some of the ideas i had and some of the questions so one of the questions that i had um, was so you know nationalism um, has done a great deal of harm uh, to religion yeah i think in general i mean it's so obvious and uh, it, it feels redundant to even say it at this point uh, because of the kind of damage it has done. And unfortunately, it has done that damage not just to uh, quote-unquote religion, but it has also done it to spirituality. Um, so Sufism, for instance, um, so much of Sufism has also been, you know, sometimes I think this is one of the biggest problems with Iqbal. I don't know if you know this guy from our region. He was a poet yes. and, uh, and supposedly the guy who thought up uh, this idea of Pakistan. I don't know if you've seen his picture. He's sitting there like of this. Of course, of course. I, I've translated a book about him <laughs> into Bosnia. Sorry? I've translated a book about Iqbal into Bosnia. So, oh, so really? Iqbal is a big figure in Bosnia. <laughs> Oh, really? Uh, yeah. um, but, you know, uh, as Noor knows, I don't like that fellow very much at all. Um, and one of the problems with, uh, uh, with Iqbal is precisely of how he transformed uh, Sufism, which he, you know, had a lot of hatred towards. Yeah. I mean, in, in his uh, dissertation, his uh, thesis, uh, uh, PhD thesis, uh, Metaphysics of Persia, uh, a lot of it is a critique of Sufism, but you know he simultaneously, of course, he couldn't do without it either. So, in forming this uh, new kind of national subject, it, it uh, you know by colonizing Sufism itself, yeah, he uh, it's colonized the interiority of Muslims. I think uh, you know it's had a really, uh, a really terrible effect on on spirituality and on spiritual traditions. Yeah, so which is why you can get. You know, there's a book there. It's called the the spiritual achievements of the Pakistan Armed Forces. Yeah, how is that possible? Yeah, yeah. Rouhani uh, Darjat or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, how how do you get there, right? So I mean, <laughs> uh, well, you get there precisely through this cooperation uh, of spirituality for nationalist ends. So I wanted to ask you. So you know, it's great that uh, you know they're reading Masnavi, but uh, you know, Rumi was no nationalist, obviously. Um, you, know, you couldn't find, uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't think you could find anything like that in anywhere in his work. Um, uh, you know, as I point out to my students here all the time, all of these, you know, great Sufi poets and thinkers uh, uh, in our region, uh, none of them wrote a national anthem. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, impossible to think that Bulle Shah, or right down to, you know, Ghalib in the late 19th century, it's impossible to imagine any of these figures ever writing a national anthem. Yeah, um, but uh, so th this is the question. My question is, uh, uh, together with this inheritance, is there also a distortion of it in this kind of new uh, milieu uh, in which we all unfortunately live? which is both, you know, imperial and modern and national and all of these wonderful things. You mean the 20th century or current yeah. moment? Oh, okay. Uh, I thought what you were referring to was you were in a, um, a techie, yeah? Yes, so basically, um, I, I wouldn't say that there is a national distortion of the reception of the Matnavi in, in Bosnia. I mean, that this is, you know, a practice which was 
continuous. Um, it got it got um, suppressed after um, you know with this with the um, foundation of the socialist Yugoslavia. So in, in the 1950s, the practice was kind of crushed. So yes, you know, modern state did crush it. Um, and it was suppressed, but then, you know, it was again revived in a clandestine way. Um, so I would say, it, I wouldn't really say that the practice of the interpretation of methnery in, in co contemporary Bosnia has been, you know, appropriated by anyone apart from, you know, these Tekia people who, who, invite, who invite the listeners. And I mean, it, it's not a, a custom which is, you know, hugely known in, in throughout the whole Bosnia. And, you know, it's just a local custom, which I found really interesting and for me was a sign of the continuation of the Persian you know, culture, which Bosnia was definitely a part of. Um, so I, I, regarding that particular um, custom, I, I wouldn't really say it was appropriated, but you're definitely right regarding the, um, the whole position of Sufism in, in the 20th century and the 21st century as well. I think the modernity has we of course uh, have on the one hand um, the orientalist pressures um, all kinds of pressures coming from that side but there are all obviously pressures coming from within uh, the muslim rethinking of, of its of their own past so i would say the sufism was probably one of the biggest victims of the 20th century um, and you know uh, the the practices the sufi practices which were absolutely normal and accepted before the 20th century have been labeled as superstition in the 20th century and later on. So I think it, it's one of the greatest um, injustices done to, to Sufism everywhere. It's not just, you know, Bosnia Balkans. Um, I think it, it's like Sufism everywhere suffered from that. On the one hand, suffered from that uh, really um, stigmatization and, and, and um, marginalization on the one hand. On the other hand, I think it suffered also from the, some efforts in reviving it, uh, which uh, in a way, which brings me again to the point of quietism. When, uh, for example, certain forms of, of Sufi practices are elevated as, you know, um, very conducive to the moment in which we are living in. So like, oh, you know, it's good to, 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 have, to be in a tarifa because you, you can then kind of purify, purify your, your nafs, your, your soul, you, but it doesn't really go beyond the individual. So that's where I have the problem with, I mean, uh, you know, historically Sufism was very much engaged with the community. It was, um, it even had, you know, political impact on, 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 on what was going on. We, we all know what happened with, uh, you know, um, Sufis in, in North Africa, um, how, you know, staunchly, I would say, anti-colonial they, they were. And, I would say that the, the, many of the forms of Sufism today suffer from uh, their um, then being cut off from this social aspect and from this aspect of, of actually influencing the society um, in, in, in different ways and relegating it only to the, to the aspect of individual enhancement or individual refinement. So I would say, you know, the problem of, of Sufism today is like twofold. On the one hand, there is this stigma that Sufism is something redundant, something unnecessary. And I think it was like a modernist stigma. I, I, I somehow see it lessening in the last, um, in the last couple of decades. But um, there is definitely this other danger of, of making it um, look more uh, or simply like a new age movement rather than really, really um, a huge religious force, which was, um, probably predominant in the pre-modern period. Right. Uh, well, you know, one of, one of the reasons, I mean, you know, as I was saying earlier, so the, I, mean, I, I don't know how it's possible to think of spirituality without ethics. And once you talk about ethics, uh, you know, this, so this is one of the bizarre things in our times, just like uh, spirituality and religion have been torn apart as if you, that you could be religious without being spiritual. Yeah. Uh, or be spiritual without being religious. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, you've taken also spirituality and ethics yeah. and religion. Yeah. So the three of them are supposed to be separate things. Uh, so how can you be spiritual without being ethical? And of course mm -hmm. there, are, you know, spiritualism and spirituality in this part of the critique of new age stuff is, uh, has just become a massive business. It's unbelievable yeah. how huge, uh, you know, I mean, uh, unfortunately, you know, in India, 
and it's a big part of the disaster that's unfolding uh, in India also, uh, is this complete uh, you know, co-optation of, uh, uh, of spirituality mm-hmm. uh, precisely you know, into this kind of thing that you're talking about, this uh, individual. Um, I just want to relatedly make the point, I think some of the most successful decolonial, um, uh, what should one say, uh, actors, you know, agents, um, you know, I think of Amir Abdul Qadir, mm-hmm. who I, uh, in, you know, just sounds like such an, such an incredible, I mean, yeah. you can't, you know, unlike so many other revolutionaries, etc., who you can find all kinds of, um, you know, uh, questionable things about their lives, etc. Amir Abdul Qadir just seems to me to be just an impeccable, um, you know, uh, historical agent, and obviously he was, you know, uh, you know, the, he was a great spiritual uh, master uh, as well. And I think that I think that uh, the, his impeccable revolutionary and ethical stature has a lot to do with that. Uh, yeah. And you know, I mean, of course, Gandhi doesn't measure up to him, but uh, you know, the other person that you can think of is Gandhi. Unfortunately, he messed up. Uh, in all in, in all kinds of uh, silly ways, uh, uh, even in his old age, but uh, that was you know I think uh, basically like a lack of his uh, spiritual uh, rectitude. Yeah, um, but nevertheless, once again, one of the most successful de- uh, um, anti-colonial decolonial uh, actors who for whom uh, it's inextricable from the question of uh, spirituality. Yeah, and and retreat, Khalwati. Yeah, uh, so you know, so that Khalwati dimension. I think, um, you know, it's very interesting. This I, I don't want to take up too much time, but it's very interesting as a, because I was just uh, before this, a couple of hours before this, I was listening to the book launch uh, of this new book. Uh, it's called by Asim Sajjad Akhtar. Uh, I'm really excited that the book is here, and it's very edifying. Uh, theoretically also rich. It's called The Struggle for Hegemony in Pakistan, Fear, Desire, and Revolutionary Horizons, uh, published by Pluto Press. But towards the end, you you know, so um, he's a, you know, Marxist and part of um, uh, the Awami Workers' Party, uh, etc. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for him, uh, but like a lot of left culture, so towards the end uh, of the book, as well as his talk on the book today, uh, there was an open call for new forms of subjectivity, yeah, uh, but nothing specific at all, yeah. General left culture is just not able. This is one of the reasons we are doing this uh, series, decolonial Islamic spiritualities, and your talk also fits into this, yeah. Um, precisely, yeah. It's a, uh, it, it won't do at this point to just make these general calls, yeah. <laughs> Uh, for new forms of subjectivity. This is where you have to, uh, this is where you have to go. If you want to create the kind of ethical subjects we're going to need, you know, ethical subjects uh, uh, of extraordinary stature, if you're going to measure up to what's happening, you know, today, all over the world. And how are they going to do it? I think what you're suggesting is actually absolutely essential to that task. That's what We, we try. Is it okay if I jump back in with a few more uh, questions, Naman? Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. Sorry, I took um, so much. Oh, no, not at all. It's, 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 it's a discussion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually wanted to follow up, and I hope it's not too off topic, but I was really interested to hear, on your, hear about your translation work of Iqbal. Uh, and how I, I'm just very curious. You, you, know, you mentioned that he's a big figure in Bosnia, and like, I feel like there's something really interesting going on there, like about like the translation of you know his philosophy into the Bosnian context. Like, please, like, could you share a bit more about that? Um, I'd be very well, basically. I think I would say that there was even like a small translate translators movement in in um, in Bosnia after the war, so after 1995, um, and a couple of books were translated about Iqbal and and by Iqbal, um, and I think at some point there was even a chair of Iqbal being established at the Faculty of Islamic Studies. Um, I'm not really sure whether it's functional at at the moment. Um, So, you know, people do, I mean, 
you know, when I, when I talk to my friends who, for example, study um, South Asia, they're always quite, uh, quite surprised when I tell them what, what we actually read in Bosnia, you know, like in this period, like after 1995. So for example, Mohamed Assad was, um, like his, his work um, has been translated in, in, into Bosnian several times, uh, Fazlul Rahman, um, like all these like really luminaries who, who, who either had a huge, who either hailed from, from the region or, or contributed to it. Um, I would say that they definitely had a certain intellectual impact on, on what was going on in Bosnia. Now, I mean, if, if, I guess like um, there is an idea for, um, an intellectual history or, or like some cross-regional history to be done, um, definitely rising. Like I, would I would love to see someone do, do um, um, like a research on these intellectual connections. Uh, and I think it kind of goes way beyond to let's say 1970s, uh, when um, Ali Azadbegovic, who was the first Bosnian president, um, wrote his uh, declaration, Islamic declaration or something. So he was, he was later on imprisoned for that. Um, but in, in Islamic declaration, and there is another work, Islam between West and East, he does mention uh, Pakistan as a role model. So I would say it kind of goes intellectually to, to, to you know, these um, early beginnings, you know, looking into, into I mean, it, it, it can so sound naive to us today, obviously, but um, some of these things were, uh, the way I see them were um, based on looking for a certain type of model for a certain type of alternative to what was going on, you know, Ali Azebegovic was writing in, in in Yugoslavia, which you know was really like religious expressions were not really uh, allowed publicly. You know, they, these people felt all kinds of pressures, so they looked upon different models. So one of the models was Pakistan, and you know, like Pakistan Islamic um, Republic, and, and and things like that. So all of these things, I think, affected the way. Uh, Pakistan was received in the psyche, um, but also like how production, which was related to Pakistan, whether uh, through, you know, Iqbal or whether through Muhammad Assad, you know, or, or whether through um, Fazl Rahman was somehow, you know, embedded in, in all of this. But um, yeah, I think that there is definitely um, an intellectual history waiting to be written about it. That's fascinating. And it's, I love the paradox of this kind of trans-regionalism in the service no. of nationalism. It's kind, kind of, of yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And also like, yeah, and like also the way that it's almost drawing on, I really feel like as you were talking and you were describing these links between South Asia and Bosnia, it really brought to mind the, the links that have always existed between South Asia and the Ottoman Empire that, yeah, um, yeah that in, in West, in the Western Academy really aren't studied that much um, because they're considered two separate disciplines in geographic areas but like it just you know I mean you had used to have like you know um, one recent bit of reading I've been I've been doing which reminded me a lot of this is that um, you know going back to Halvati's in the 19th century at the Ottoman court and Janita you know this I'm, I'm sure but I'm just sharing it for the audience um, there were a number of Halvati figures who derived their spiritual authority from having uh, joined the Tariqa through um, Indian uh, Halvati masters in Delhi. Yeah, so they would travel to India, get their, uh, you know, in induction into the Tariqa there and join that particular silsila of Halvati, you know, uh, Halvati's there. And then that was how they established their spiritual authority. Um, you know, in Istanbul or in Damascus or wherever it was, it was through this journey to South Asia. And I just feel like there's like some echoes of this happening almost, you know, uh, this sort of like mystical, um, you know, almost South Asia is the, the, this mystical land of, of some kind of Islamic authenticity yeah. or something, you know, that, 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 that there's some echo of this in, in this construction of like Iqbal, you know, being yes. adopted in, you know, post-1995 Yugoslavia. Um, so in I guess there's Iran. an example. Sorry? No, I just wanted to add that in Iran also, his uh, 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 Iqbal's work mm -hmm. is uh, very influential in this period that is in the you know, 20th century. Yeah. Most of, uh, I mean, and um, yeah, I don't think he's had a good effect there either. <laughs> you, you know, um, just to kind of add, um, we, I mean, obviously we, we talk about nationalism as something which is, and obviously I think the nation state is, 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 was a horrible context for for uh, many, um, you know, 
religious expressions and, and forms and, and for people like in general, it, it was, it, mm. it's a bad, it's a bad framework. But I would also say that, you know, um, it seems to me that Muslims have been like latecomers to, to, to nationalism. And mm. as latecomers, you know, you always have to kind of catch up with, you know, the rest of the world um, in order not to, you know, disappear. So uh, the way people were enthusiastic about Pakistan or even Iran at, at some point was the fact that these countries, um, you know, they do have certain type of symbolic framework or, or um, I mean, we can obviously talk about the violence of nation states, but in the psyche of people, it sounded like, oh, well, there is this country and it's, it's you know, Islamic. So let's look it up, look up, up to it. And obviously it's, it's horribly naive. It's, it's horribly, you know, um, when, when we look at it from today, but um, you kind of have to understand these people why they were looking for any kind of solution, you know, to, to the state they were living in and uh, to the state which they felt oppressed under uh, in some ways. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I, I also, um, another kind of related question I was gonna ask about is with the Hajj um, mm -hmm. and how that figures into, I mean, it's part of your, I mean, it's your, your wider research topic, but um, just the way that it, it kind of um, is, you know, almost the the thing that kind of negates the very notion of nationalism in the yep. Muslim world, right? I mean, it really explodes the concept of nationalism mm -hmm. and makes it very difficult, actually, <laughs> you know, uh, to have a coherent nationalism because it, it just really brings to the fore, you know, these other allegiances and, and ultimate allegiances mm -hmm. that one has to, you know, uh, a place, be it, a, be it only mythical, right? Like the hedge of the heart, you know? Um, but I, yeah, I just wonder if that might be, you know, the, the, these kinds of, as you say, I mean, I feel like there's a connection with that uh, and this idea of the decolonial of the, of the ordinary, right? Like if the hedge might be one of these notions, one of these ideas or resonances or, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that plays into this, uh, mm -hmm. The, you know, the kind of quiet subversion of things like the oppression of the nation state, for instance, with the oppressions of modernity, not even the fact of going on the hajj, but just of its existence, right, or of there being a hajj of the heart, or of having a framework that you turn toward other than the nation, or other than, you know, modernity, or other than, you know, we were talking a bit about technology and the worship of technology, you know, so I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if that plays it, it if that's that might not have been so much a part of your talk today but as a part of your wider research it would be great to to hear your thoughts on that well i mean you know hajj is definitely mm. like a boundless topic um, mm. and when we think about it in terms of you know um hajj as um something which breaks the boundaries of the nation state mm. i think the the danger like the perceived danger of hajj uh, of the hajj was not only in what you know oh there all these muslims are going to meet there but uh, the, the way danger was perceived by, for example, colonial authorities was, but what will they bring to the local contexts? You know, mm. what kind of ideas are going, they are going to bring into their local context? And what are these Muslims going to ask in their local contexts from you know, colonial powers, from nation, nation state? And, and, mm -hmm. So I would say that it, Hajj breaks very, uh, barriers, but from two sides. So it's mm. on the one hand to show you that you actually belong to, that you have more allegiances. But on the other hand, that um, you actually also care deeply about your local context as well. Mm -hmm. like the country you came from matters mm -hmm. deeply even when you're on Hajj. So um, that's what my investigation of Bosnian Hajj discourses showed, that these people definitely, care, they definitely cared about going on a Hajj and, and you know, being a part of the Ummah in, in, in the full sense. But they also really, really equally cared about um, Bosnia as well. So mm. they, they, were, they were trying to kind of bring Bosnia to, to Hajj and, and also carry Hajj into Bosnia. So it, like these things are, are quite um, in, in flux. And obviously nation state is always trying to kind of uh, regulate and, and, mm. and do something about it. Um, but but these, these things like these allegiances go beyond the physical mobility as well. You know, spiritual mm. mobilities are spiritual attachments are uh, attachments which are really hard to break mm -hmm. so you can maybe stop the physical mobility but you know spiritual attachment will remain mm -hmm. will remain through mechanisms such as these sermons and, and you mm -hmm. know, 
these types of um, yeah. ways of, in which religious knowledge can be transmitted. I mean, not only religious knowledge, but also religious sentiments. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Hajj, I just want to mention and the and its impact. Uh, I just want to mention yesterday was Malcolm X's birthday. And mm. of course, it had a huge, the, his Hajj, uh, you know, legendarily had a big impact on his, uh, on his consciousness and practice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Him. I mean, he, he shifted his practice mm. in a way. Yeah. And maybe it goes back to that question of subjectivity that uh, mm -hmm. came up at the uh, the book launch you were talking about with uh, Noman, with the Asim Sajad Akhtar's book launch, with the these questions of like, oh, we need new subjectivity, or you know, I mean, I I have I you know have a critique of the notion of subjectivity itself, mm -hmm. but like let's put that aside for a moment, you know, <laughs> like or you know concepts of interiority. I mean, um, yeah, I mean that's a brilliant example of. Uh, you know, a distinct shift that happened and in, in, in a radical shift that happened um, in in one's, in Malcolm X's subjectivity, for example, as a result of this uh, ritual experience, right? That was, you know, um, a tool, uh, you know, I mean, if we see ritual almost as a tool, right? Or, a, or transform, like a transformative method almost, right? Um, it might be a good way to look at it as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, we just had a message on the chat. Do we want to, do we have any questions coming from the... Uh, this uh, comment must be from uh, Facebook. Yeah. Uh, who, uh, who wrote this? <laughs> it's very kind. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Somebody called Momin Khan. Uh, mm -hmm. says microphonic voices and stunning scholarship. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, Noor, do you have others? I mean, there's lots to talk about. I, I have tons of notes over here. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could, I could, I wanted to ask a little bit more um, specifically about the Ottoman context as well, mm -hmm. uh, if that's okay. Go ahead, um, yeah, which is, which is kind of, uh, you know, Janita spoke a lot about in her talk, and I wanted to learn a bit more about you know, kind of the 17th century context of like the way that the um, Vise books were being, like my, my question is just, were they, you know, uh, kind of one of the methods of uh, the Sunnitization or, or confessionalization mm -hmm. that was going on at the time? And also I wanted to ask if the, you know, the author of this particular set of works, was he embedded in the wider like Ottoman um, madrasa system that was, was sort of in place and active by this time and, and had a very, uh, you know, kind of tight grip. So the scholarship seems to seems to portray it as having a very kind of uniform and tight grip over what was taught and, you know, the curriculums and the way that, um, you know, that religious practice was was perpetuated. So yeah, where do you where do you situate these works? And also the Halvatis, of course, being a very kind of establishment exactly. order, right, like very close to the state. And, you know, they become very, very prominent in, in the reigns of certain sultans. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, just situating these works a bit more in, in the, um, the context. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think one of the challenges which I want to deal with uh, in, in, in a creative way, uh, I mean, to try to deal with it in a creative way is to, how do you actually work with figures uh, on, who you, on whom you don't really have much? Mm -hmm. So, um, and for example, you know, I've done extensive research in, in, in Bosnian uh, manuscript libraries. And what I could see there is that, you know, you have these really extensive works such as these like sermon collections and you have re really scant information about the author. This mm -hmm. is not the first time I, I encounter some, something like that. So one of the ways to kind of go um, around it is to uh, basically, and that's what I used to do um, at some point to kind of note down whatever was read you know, whatever the author mentions as, as the source, then I would note down and then I would try to kind of find um, the, um, I would kind of try, try to find, um, to understand the library this person had. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, if you, if you see um, certain types of works uh, being repeated in, in a certain context, then you, you kind of know, oh, you know, this was read in, in this period and, uh, it can give you uh, a certain type of an intellectual outlook this person had, as well as, um, 
you can kind of place them also on, on some level of, of scholarship as well. Um, obviously, you can also look into the uh, number of, of manuscript copies which were circulated. Mm -hmm. and this person, uh, Moezen Zade, um, he definitely ha has um, copies of, of his um, sermon collections in, in different various places um, mm -hmm. across Bosnia. Um, so, but I then, uh, then you know, um, I still think about how, um, what is the proper way to kind of resolve this. And I think one of the ways is uh, what I think was proposed by Marion Katz, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is to kind of look into, into this um, religious production um, in, a, in a wider way, to not only see it as uh, the uh, opposition between the ulema and, you know, the, the popular masses which were uneducated or something, but to see all kinds of levels um, of literacy in between. Mm -hmm. So I would situate these authors um, of sermon collections from Bosnia, for example, the ones I, I worked on, um, I would situate them on the level of like this mid cult. So people mm -hmm. who were obviously educated enough, who, who went through the madrasa system, and you, you can see that they know Arabic, they know Persian. Mm -hmm. uh, so they went through this process but at the same time, they, they probably didn't want a prestigious place in, in, in some of the larger centers of the empire in Istanbul mm. or in Cairo. So they remained you know, locally based, but very locally influential as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ways to kind of understand what, like, what, was the, uh, you know, social, what were the social circumstances of, of these people. And um, so for example, I, you know, having too much information about author was something which Unfortunately, I've never encountered in, in my work. Like I always have to, had to kind of uh, work yeah. creatively with the material or try to work creatively with the material. material. But um, the basic facts which we have is that these people were um, active in locally. They were also active regionally because they had connections to Sufis in, in other centers in, in, in the region. Um, and at certain points, obviously, uh, some of them obvi uh, probably traveled to Istanbul as well and, and made some certain mm -hmm. impact there as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Naman, do you want to jump in with a question? So. Uh, no, no, actually, I mean, I do have questions, but, um, you know, um, we've taken up lots of lots oh. time. Also, we've been going on for a long time. Uh, <laughs> okay, <so> I, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's been uh, really cool. So I think we should. Um, should we draw, draw to a close? Yes. <laughs> okay. um, what do you think? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I've I've asked. Uh, I mean, we can always. Can, I mean, I you know can always if ask. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm. I mean, I could. I could keep talking about this forever. I think it's a fascinating topic, and and you know, I think she's doing well, really wonderful research. Really interesting discussion. Thank you so much for really enlightening uh, talk and for, you know, fabulous engagement and discussion. Um, and to uh, the viewers and listeners, uh, thank you for uh, listening in uh, to this last talk uh, in our Decolonial Islamic Spirituality uh, series. Uh, uh, once again, uh, I'd like to repeat uh, that we are going to have another series, Sajjad uh, from University of Exeter, Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, and uh, I will have another series, invite lots and lots, I mean, there's a lot of great work being done actually uh, on the intersection between poetry and philosophy in the Muslim tradition. Uh, so I hope you'll join us uh, next term for that series. Thank you so much, uh, Janita, and thank, thank you, so you so much. much. For it's a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much both. And it, it was um, like, I really enjoyed the, the, the conversation and, and made me think about some things I haven't uh, before. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Thank you.